talk to me about P.F. Sloan. I have a lot to say about P.F. Sloan. I'm in upstate New York, young guy. I hear Eve of Destruction on the radio. Um, I heard other songs of his, but it moved me so much and I was compelled and I just, so I think I started writing a song after I'd already written a few things, but never ever had any hope or wanting to be a songwriter or anything. I was interested in world peace. And I thought, boy, this really speaks to my heart, and this is what's going on in the world, and no one's capturing it. And it has kind of, I was aware of the Old Testament when I was younger and growing up, and it reminded me that his lyric and that song had the feeling of Hosea, the book of Hosea, where it says the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. And I thought, wow, this guy is really speaks to me maybe more than the Beatles, than the Beach Boys. It's close, because I was pretty serious at that point after going through years of being a juvenile delinquent. Um, P.F. Sloan, I didn't know Miss Phil as I do now, but I thought it'd be great if I could go and someday you know, meet him and talk to him. So years later came by and I come out here and I signed with the Beach Boys and as you guys know and do many things, Daniel and Marilyn, Marilyn Wilson, uh, the, the wife of Brian, her new husband, they invited me to a party and Phil Sloan was there. And we started talking and that night I went home and wrote a lyric called The Soul of a Woman, and I sent it in to him. And within a few days, he had the whole thing done. He hardly changed a word. It ended up making it to his sale over album. But we had an instant connection, and I think I inspired him and he inspired me. And he took a liking to me, and we started working on things. And we ended up going to India together. He brought me into the Wild Honey Orchestra in the 1990s, maybe 97, at the El Rey Theater. He told them, I know the original guy that wrote Little Bird and Be Still, and I, maybe I can get him to do it. And he said, would you do it? I said, well, I won't do it as a singing, but I'll do it as a, I'll combine a singing with a narration. So I did Be Still at that event. And there was like people like Matthew Sweet, and Phil did, uh, he did Sloop John B. And uh, there were all, De Cindy Lee Berryhill, a lot of the people, and a lot of bigger acts I don't remember, but there's a sheet on it somewhere. So that was the beginning of Phil. He was always doing things for me and helping me. And then when he did the album with John Tivitt, Sail Over, he included, he put music to my book, If You Knew, which Brian Wilson in the 60s had done as a spoken word and did music to it also. Uh, that things gets around. I'm driving the copyright people nuts. <laughs> I keep forgetting it's a derivative. So anyway, uh, we went to India together. We talked about spiritual things. He had he was a Sai Baba devotee, and so was John Tivin. Um, I I was not a devotee, but I was very interested in the teaching of love. And when I went to India with them, I found a lot of that teaching. And I and Sai Baba was still alive. I'm not talking about his personality, but the teaching of love was very appealing. And I soaked in India. I, I saw the beggars on the street. I saw all the monkeys that looked like gorillas to me, they were so big on the walls. And P.F. Sloan, through it all, one time we were on the river, the Ganges, and we were making fun. He was singing like Eve and other songs, but he was doing it in a comical way. We were butchering them. And it was one of the funniest moments. There's an, a video in existence, which probably be the worst video ever, but it was so much fun. And I really missed the guy. We talked every day. I'm not saying we didn't have, because when I started these interviews, uh, I was told that I should just be candid. We were, it wasn't always perfect. We, there were radical times, but he was a person that challenged me. He said, Stevie, you can do better. That's no good. And he's also responsible for some of my partnerships later with Brian May and John Tivin and Steve Cropper because he introduced me to John Tivin. And I just love this guy and I can't even say enough about him. I would say that one of, that he was one of the mo a very powerful person in my life and has influenced me 
as much as anyone. Bob Dylan, maybe the only ones on his level would be T.S. Eliot, Walt Whitman, and the scriptures. You worked with him constantly, and on your California Feeling 2 album, you collaborated with him on a tune. Yes. The process was, I gave him my book, If You Knew, the one that I did in Washington for the House and Senate for Children's Uniting Nations, the same one that Brian did. But when Brian did it, it was still handwritten. It became published. It was in the second printing, and there were a couple hardback printings all sold out. I'm, I'm going into the third printing. And... Uh, he condensed it down a little, had me change a few things, and he put it to music and put it on a sale over album. But then I asked him, could I do a different mix and a different version for California Feeling 2, which I'm grateful for Miss Music Records for putting this out for me. And he did the most beautiful job. If You Knew was my, I think I was probably also inspired by Kipling's poem, If, If. You can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it upon you, that poem. But the poem is, if you knew, like, if you knew that love was giving, would you stand in line waiting? And if you knew that love was all, would you spend your time hating? It was my way of saying what the universe was revealing to me. If you knew that death was a thought, would you let it dissolve and live forever? And, and explaining those things. I didn't really explain them, I just put that in the poem. And Phil grasped it and put it to music. And even he made a joke when Time interviewed him or Newsweek or one of them. He said, well, Stephen sent me this 250-page book, and I put it down to three pages. But it was more like a 40-page book that he, he helped me cut it down. And, uh, but he, he would always striving perfection, and he added a great dimension and layer to my life. I'm extremely grateful to him. And I doubt I would have had a lot of things going on if it wasn't for Phil. He's one of the people. You um, also wrote a tune. It's a composition you and Brian Wilson wrote that was later recorded with, by Brian Wilson with Paul McCartney. Take me through the genesis and the process of the songwriting because as long as I've known you, you always wrote titles and words and lyrics first before the music people got involved with your whole trip. Uh, that's what I seem to remember. What you say is true. I always wrote the words first and he put music to it, but in this case, Brian already had the melody, so it's one exception. That's why probably it sounds a little different than Little Bird. Brian already had a structured melody. I did not change a note of it. Uh, I put the words to it, and he gave me that melody. And on the way home from his house, I, I got this idea. It had nothing to do with Paul McCartney. It was about a friend. What kind of friend would you like? or maybe God, or something. Uh, and I didn't mean it corny, but it was like a friend. When I look back at my life, when I look back at all the years, uh, it, 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 it speaks to those kind of things. It goes, you have courage, you risk it all, you pick me up, and every time I fall, you inspire me every day of my life. A friend like you, a friend like you. and. Uh, I just meant it in such a honest, sweet way, and who of us could use a friend like that? Um, so as time evolved, Brian and I were working, the process was it, that at the second collaboration was that he would give me some melodies. Now what happened is we got three or four songs going. We also got uh, Touch Me, You Touched Me, which was also on that album, if you remember. And originally it was called Touch Me Angel, which I like a lot. I probably even like it better than the one we did. But that was like a 50s, you know, cherry, I'm full of cherry soda. It was like going back to that era, you know, you touched me. Uh, I reach out across eternity. That melody would go. And But somebody said, well, there's already an angel song, which I don't know what has to do really with that I had Touch Me Angel because I still would stand by that and if I record it again I may put that in there. Um, and the McCartney one, they got Paul to do it as a duet and that was on his album Getting In Over My Head which was kind of rushed out. It's available now on vinyl. So it sold a lot of records and I was able to buy 
you know, get an apartment and do different things, and it helped me a lot. I, on that one, I was able to get half the publishing and half the writers and half of everything. And uh, but I, uh, I was not able. I don't know if I was not able. I was. I don't think I was invited to the final session, but Mark Lynette did it. But I just want to make it clear, I did not write it for Paul McCartney. He did it. What I told Brian is, I am not going to say I wrote it for him because it's not true. But if you want to dedicate it to him, that's okay. how I said it. I think it was promoted more like written as a friendship, which sounds like a kiss-ass thing, which I am not a, anybody that knows me. I don't do that kind of crap. I just don't do it. It was about friendship. And I got a lot of criticism. Pe one guy said I should be killed for writing such a sappy lyric. Now, it did bother me, although Brian, I think, thought it was funny. But I'm sure the guy probably wasn't literally true, or they just didn't like it. But the thing is, there are some hardened people in the world, and my, and I feel it's their problem, not mine. But they're entitled to their opinion. They're entitled not to like. Here's me. what I here's what I'm entitled what do you to think? say. I think it's really cool that Paul McCartney has sung your song, and every one of the Beach Boys has sung some of your songs. I like that. I love that, and I feel honored. And the funny thing is. The one song that I did to his melody, like California Feeling, I wrote the words first and the title. Little Bird, I wrote the word and the title. Rainbows, I wrote the word and the title. Be Still, I wrote the word and the title. Time to Live in Dreams. Every one of my songs, A Child of Winter, even with Brian, was all I did the words first and then the music came. But this one, and the music is different on this than the other ones. This is the most misunderstood song, which is a great blessing in my life that I had the honor of Paul McCartney singing on my song or not. I love the fact that he did it. I think that in this day and age it's hard to believe that people still believe that love is powerful, that love and, and trying to be understanding and that want to attack it and want to kill it and want to nail it on a cross or nail it somewhere. I think it's the same story. Anytime you go up against an idea of, of something like that, people say it's unrealistic, it's not real in the world. Well, it's real, but I'm not, the thing is that people didn't understand, and I think you do now that you know me. I am not a guy to take much bullshit. I even controlled my relationships a lot with Brian and Dennis, and the fact I was, when I wrote with them, except later, was different state with Brian when I put the music, but in the beginning, I was the one that would, was more forceful, I would say, in the in the creative partnership. Not better, just more forceful. My personality, I guess I must have, a, and still probably do a healthy ego. But the thing that I try and do, I'm trying to be aware of my ego and use it in service of others and not just myself. And I'm not saying that to be praised. I'm no do good, do good, or in fact, someone who's too good and like that, I guess you can be suspect. But I, I'd never had, no one ever told me I was too good. It's okay. And if you have to be prepared, if you go into this battlefield of pop music, which before, as you know, when you and I started, we really believed in love. We were trying to do that. When the music people got, got handled by the business people and it became a business, an exploitation, the Grateful Dead became a product, the Beatles, the Stones, the Beach Boys, they took some of the joy out of the music. And before you knew it, now the artists aren't even making money. So, it's a plea. I wrote that poem, years, you remember that in the way back, Harvey. I, the poet, cry out to my world, you know. Uh, I cry out for the natural man. Never has he been more needed than our time. I cry in a world torn with wars and murders and hate. That always the voice of peace and silence, there will be a hatchet. Look at the Holocaust. Look at the things that people don't want to talk about. Look at all the positive thinking movements, which have some good in them, but you can't ignore the fact of all the people starving in the world and all the things like that. I'm not going to sit by. I do write crazy, funny songs and stupid songs too, but I also want to do aware songs that make people think. I did a song with Brian May on, on, on the, uh, this new album to the other album, Each Soul Has a Voice with John Tivitt, called Rude Awakening. It's awakening from the belief that materiality can solve anything. And I'll stand by those ideas, and uh, I'm open to criticism and open to talk, but for the people that don't like me, I, I don't hate you. I, I, I even love you and understand you, but I, 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 I mean no harm. 
And sometimes maybe someone brought to my attention lately, this is very important, Harvey. When I wrote Be Still, some person said jokingly, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me to be still. And what I'm saying is, I'm, try, I'm saying be still as a consideration. It's my view. I'm not ordering you to be still. So if I ever give that tone when I read, God forgive me, I don't mean it. So I wanted to say it publicly on a video. Now, while you brought him up uh, since our last discussion, John Tiven, like P.F. Sloan, is a vital component of your creative journey. Uh, on your recent new California Feeling 2 album, and uh, efforts and endeavors with you know Yo Mama, and just songwriting and gigging with him and going down to Nashville. So talk to me about him and how he entered the dynamic. And John Tibben is an amazing guy. He's just a wonderful, talented, energetic, and his wife Sally. And he was even friends with the guy that wrote the Basketball Diaries. They used to go with Patti Smith. He produced the first Alex Chilton record. He did a co-produced a record with Steve Cropper, The Five Royals, which you know about. And he's just a wonderful guy, and he's helped me a lot. But what he did is he tuned into a side of me where songs that I wouldn't write, where I created a pseudonym, Yo Mama. Actually, isn't it The Five Royals? But that's a whole other rap. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, anyway, not a problem. I, I, I stand corrected. I just couldn't let that go by. I Don't just, let it go by. I, Don't I, let, I, I, I'm not we, the thought police. It's just... It's I'm okay. a freedom fighter. I stand. Yeah, thank and you. I That's stand, also Steve Cropper's favorite guitarist. I stand is by. That, I stand. Is, is in that group. Okay, you have done a lot of work in the spoken word community and the poetry community. Readings, uh, working with Bernard Fowler, who sings with the Rolling Stones, Stacy Keach, um, Rod Seiger did some of your poems. You've been around, you, you met Jim Morrison, you've been around this poetry and spoken word thing for decades. But I want to know how being an active poet from publishing to doing poetry readings has influenced and informed uh, the most recent recordings you've done. I mean, I know you're doing a bit of singing on some more recent recordings, but what do you get from the poetry and the word world that informs your lyric writing that might be different, let's say, on this new California feeling too? That's a great question. What I would say is, and I don't mean this unkindly, I don't really too much love, although I do some poetry readings and poetry groups with other poets. It's not, it just seems like too much for one night uh, to grasp it all. I like opening for a rock act some I become that kind of spoken word artist. I like clubs with other musical groups, maybe one or two poets. On occasion, I'll find someone I, I want to collaborate with. I I like I I would say that the poetry world, for me, I would like to combine it more with music and use it at music events because you can reach more people. And sometimes I will chant, as you you've heard me before, if you can call it that. And so what, what John Timmon did and other these people and Brian May on the record, I sang, they wanted me to sing. I know I'm not the greatest singer. I know you're, people say, don't say that on, on video, or, but I, I'm not. But I've learned, Carl Wilson taught me, and I said this before, Stevie, just whisper, whisper, and then add volume. So when I sing, you know, you know you are, and then there's room for volume, and you're probably not gonna go off pitch. So I'm learning, and then when I got with Tiven, it became more rock and roll, you know, things like, you know, just like Mick Jack, whatever style it might be or whoever I want to do. So I, I'm loving it, I'm enjoying it, and maybe the pressure's not on to be a number one lead singer. And I, and I like the sharingness, and I like the camaraderie, and I like something that I didn't get in the early Beach Boy days. I'm learning to meet all the background players, the guys in the band, and they're wonderful. And a lot of them don't get heralded. There's more than just the wrecking crew. There's all kind of schmecking crews and people that no one even heard of that I think should be celebrated. There's great musicians. I met a young musician, uh, Rob Bonfilio, who, who maybe is not a household name, but a great guy. Caitlin Wolfberg. I've met a lot of great people. Uh, Dan Collins. I, just so many different people that have been really wonderful, and I'm so grateful to all of them. 
Uh, about a year and a half ago, you opened for Rodriguez at the El Rey Theater. Oh, my Talk God. Talk to me about that. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I mean, what I a... did see you perform Be Still in front of a packed room. It was kind of meditative, and there was a keyboard up there, and I just thought that was really cool. Alan Boyd. I had to sneak my friend Tracy Landecker into the dressing room because I only had one pass, and I gave it to my friend Jill that you know, Jill Jarrett. But um, I, uh, Matt calls me, the owner of Light in the Attic, and he said, it's our 10th anniversary and we're picking four artists. And he said, we'd like you to be one, one of them, Stephen, and we'd like you to do Be Still from your World of Peace album. First of all, I was shocked. And also, secondly, I got paid. My God, a poet getting paid, this is like, I, I thought it was like the, the beginning of the second coming. In fact, I thought maybe I'll get, I'll get Kubernick in the mix. So anyway, um, I was thrilled to open for him, and we had a great talk, and his car broke down, and I hung out with him a lot, and we talked a lot. Somewhere there's pictures of us. I think there's one out, but he's a sweet guy. He seemed a little fragile then, but I think he was having problems with his vision. But that was a great experience, Harvey. I know they came to see Rodriguez, but a couple people came to see me, like my friend Chip Rosenblum and his wife, Kathleen, and Olivia, and Alex, his kids, and that was a big thrill for me. And Jill came, and Harvey was there. And I think Harvey, G, all, some people that, that finally got a chance to see me in a big venue, and Alan Boyd did a beautiful job. And, I, and Alan Boyd said at the end, sing it. So I sang it after I recited it, kind of like I did with The Wild Honey, but I did less of it. And it was just a wonderful, and more people came up to me after I was having a fight with my boyfriend and what you said and be still and you know things like that I, I don't know who the people were but I was kind of blown away that these young kids could relate to this it was just I did that thing 50 years ago the first time I'm doing it again and I, I just did it at the recent thing I just said thank you whatever graces run this universe that I'm able to do this sometimes before a concert I'll feel ill not because of that but I'm I'm a diabetic I have things I just want you to know but you, if you're creating, you can get through almost anything, you know, up till now anyway. You met Jim Morrison a handful of times and saw the doors plenty. And it was his common law wife, Pam, that was uh, very encouraging to you as a poet as well, or both of them. Both of them, but Pam first, she picked me up in her little BM, uh, B, what, the bug, what do you call that? Volkswagen. Volkswagen, yeah. I want to say there's some next thing they used to call it, BW. Right. <laughs> My mind, Harvey. Um, yeah, she picked me up on Santa Monica Boulevard and when I first signed with the Beach Boys and she told me Jim liked the Beach Boys better than, than the, uh, or well, he liked them as much as the Beatles and he really loved them and he was he loved Brian. And, uh, and uh, I recited Leaves of Grass to her, not the Whitman version, but my version that I recorded that no studio would release because they thought it was marijuana and the magic hand and a few poems, which I later got to recite for Jim and then later for Ray Manzarek. I was at the Oakland airport visiting my friend John and Lisa Moss and their kids. And I think you know them, Carol Moss is yes. their mom. And uh, yeah, really active in the Malibu scene. And um, so I ordered a limo and he, they said sometimes there's two people to go to Napa Valley because my friend that owns Poponi's, Johnny Paoletti, owns a vineyard. And I was going there, and so some guy comes up with a guitar and a glass, and I said, hey, you know, I said, I used to know you a little, but I haven't seen you in a long time. I said, you look just like Ray Manzarek. He's I am. So we, we rode, well, it was just the two of us, we rode the limo together, we sat next to each other. He said, recite a few, and I recited him The Magic Hand and A Tale of Man, and he loved it. And he said, send me some lyrics. And then you got involved with us and Harvey, and, uh, the sweetest guy, and he's, you know, I still believe in all that stuff, Stephen. I loved Ray Manzarek, and I loved the way he played, but he did stuff with my friend, which I know you know, Michael C. Ford, and he, he was really into poetry and things, too. He was a great guy. They're, they're, all, they're all great guys, and I, I've had, the, since I've done a few things, like a funeral, John Densmore and I both did poems at, and John came up and gave me a hug and kissed me after it was our friend Patrick Morris, and I don't mean to be throwing all these names, but this is a, a painter an artist that was a great guy and uh, so th there's a community 
where Harvey and my friend Dick Gutman and other PR, that all people that works with Streisand and Kerry, that where all the thread runs from the Beach Boys, from the Babies to the Beatles to T.S. Eliot. I'm just saying there is a like a fabric, there's like a quilt connecting us all. I'm into, I think in one of my poems I said, if only we could all sleep under a gigantic quilt, you know, like, and, and the division bet that separates people, even though it's in the world there, that I don't really see a real need for it. So, but it's okay. there. This year, in May, is the 50th anniversary of the retail release of the Beach Boys Pet Sounds album. I know you met Brian on the heels of Pet Sounds just before he was starting the Smile Project. And you have um, had your songs performed on stage. In fact, on the Beach Boys 50th Year Reunion Tour, I know that, um, you know, uh, people did Little Bird on stage occasionally at the concerts of the repertoire. David Marks. David Marks, people. an original Beach Boy member, yeah. uh, sang it. And then Jeff Beck. Jeff Beck heard the tune, didn't he? Yeah, well, the funny thing is when Al Jardine said, this is Stevie Kalinich, the road California feeling, and, he's, and he goes, and Jeff Beck... Shakes hand, he goes, little bird up in a tree. And he, he says, you got more like that? And I said, son, I've got many more. Just give me a call. <laughs> so what does Pet Sounds mean to you at the half a century mark? As mixed up as all of us are with all of our problems, which I'm not ashamed to say, I have no perfect answers, no perfect solutions, as many crazy things and impulses and feelings and hurts and this, that we that the Beach Boys could take out of those lives that were not always harmonious, that had a lot of interest, that Brian Wilson could create out of Hawthorne, California, something that transcended time and space that seemed to find the harmony that it's okay to be wounded and fractured. And to have a stillness and a softness about yourself as well as to have other moods and seasons. Pet Sounds, to me, speaks to the heart and to the consciousness of mankind that out of this, that maybe an album like this could have never appeared at any other point in history. It just met the needs of the time. I think for those of us that really perceived it, and Harvey, you, you can comment on this because it was like a tonic. It was like a, that you read about the fountain of youth, it was like a drink that would replenish you when you were thirsty, when you're starving, when you're going along, my life's mixed up. There was such beauty and such sadness. It was sitting on a bed of deep sadness. And yet the harmony was saying, don't worry, baby, whatever, it's going to be all right. And, and that somehow mankind, with all its broken footsteps and all its fragments, can pull together. I think it's a testament that from broken parts, beautiful art can come. I know it's difficult to compare and contrast, but you had some encounters with George Harrison. At times, when I was around him a little bit, and especially Brian over decades, they remind me of each other. Do you get that? Well, at some level, George would be was more expressive of it, but Brian did it in his music. But when Brian and I talked one-on-one, -on -one, and we did World of Peace album, which I've got to say, I don't know if he's on that page now, he's got other things going on. Yes. It was before he was remarried, all the stuff. But I would say that they're very kindred in the sense that Within You and Without You is probably my favorite Beatles song. Why? Because of the content of the message and the use of the sitar, but we were talking about the space between us all and the people who hide themselves behind a wall of illusion. And isn't that the same thing that Pet Sounds is? Why do you think I asked the question? Well, you're brilliant, but you, you they gave me, I gave you a real answer, and you gave me a trick question. Well, okay. It's okay. You are a clever person, anyway. Fellow Pisces like George, let me ask you and, a question. And George also, which nobody knows, 
I guess a few people know, he was the first one I gave a handwritten copy. I gave it to Nat King Cole's daughter, mm -hmm. not not Natalie. Cece? But the, one of the other yeah, ones. I don't, yeah. They picked me up hitchhiking. I gave her my last copy of a handwritten version of If You Knew before Brian Wilson even recorded it with me. So George somewhere has the handwritten version. And I when I met Danny at Mr. Chow's a few a few months ago, and he came over and he said he knew who I was, he knew about Little Bird, and uh, I... Uh, I told him how much his father, and George was so encouraging to me. And I met him a few times also with Mo at Poponi's. Now, whether he made the connection that I was the guy from Little Bird or not, you know, you don't, every time you meet someone, you don't say, pull out your credits, at least I don't. It's kind of embarrassing, you know, like, are you the guy that did that? So, uh, and I'll usually say, no, that was my father. So, because it shows my age. But it's a blessing. And then I, I was at an event, and someone came up to me that picked, Little Bird for Nora Jones to do at the Bryan Fest, which I wasn't able to go to. And they, they didn't even know how that I was around or living or anything. And they, they came up to me and I got a few letters from them. They work with the George Harrison estate and they said, we want to have a lunch or something. We want to find out all about Little Bird and how it was created and all those kind of things. So as, as you know, Harvey, which he never took credit, but Brian wrote the bridge on Little Bird, uh, the music part of it, and even changed a couple words. And uh, where's my pretty bird? But he he only left Dennis and my name on it. He never took the credit, and he denied it. But I knew he did, and you're and now he will say that he did do it. But that was a, like a gift, mostly to Dennis, but partially to me. And uh, there's there's verses in Little Bird, which you didn't ask me this, Harvey, but that were left out of the song. There was one thing, and this is in the '60s before all this movement, before things become real. They are first in your mind. A love thought draws others of its kind. So cling to every thought that is real and your life will be free. Free for love. Free for life in which to grow. The little bird looked down and sang a song to me. So there's a few verses like that and some of the other songs, A Time to Live in Dreams. So there's more. All right. Uh, were you or are you a fan of the monkeys? I love the monkeys and my ex-wife, Renee. Sweetheart, she was. I would think I was jealous of Davy Jones, because like oh, so many girls liked him, and I thought, here's a girl that only likes classical music. When she met Dennis, she says, "And what is it that you do?" And he and he started laughing. He said, "She's so funny." I said, "No, she really doesn't know, man. She listens to classical music." It was it was pretty funny, and Dennis is standing on the hood of his Rolls Royce. It was really funny, and a sweet thing. What did you like about the Monkees music, the productions, Chip Douglas? I just like them. They remind me of like the Baby Beatles. <laughs> I used to call them if you can relate to that. And I was on the lot when they were shooting, and I met one of their managers, a blonde guy. You probably know his name. And he became friendly with me. And David I, Pearl, maybe. Yeah, and I talked to him. And even I think they were shooting. Sally Fields was doing that show, Gidget. And I would talk to her. And I was just in the office like... What were you doing hanging out at Screen Gems and Goward I got Gulch a in Columbia? I got a part-time job, which I never told anyone this. You never told me this. Yeah, I got a part-time job through Temp, and I lived at the Hollywood Y for $15 a week. Yeah, but how did you get on the lot? I got a part-time job in the office there where the monkeys was shot at that no. time. No. Yeah, so no, I never knew I'd be in showbiz <laughs> or a songwriter or that I'd get... So you were watching the frenzy going down. Yeah, yeah, and I was part of it, and I, I wasn't... So I, I liked it, and they were great, and I talked to that one guy, John, a blonde, good-looking guy. For some reason, he took a liking to me, but somebody in the office where I worked, I kind of got fired, didn't like me. But I had a couple scary encounters on the way to work. I once got picked up by a bunch of hitchhikers that seemed like killers, and I'll never forget it to this day, a car full of people, and, and I heard them say, like, should we kill them or something like that? And they said, and the girl said, no, let them out. And that was scary, but that was, Hollywood was a crazy place then. Mm. Of course, I think the best story you've ever had is when you were going to Syracuse University, you lived in the fraternity house with Felix Cavalier before he formed the Rascals. Yeah, he was also with Joey D. the Starlight. Right, and what was he like as a musician before the Rascals? He was incredible. He would entertain the whole house, and they used to call me a, a grill because I had braces, and my roommate had a retainer, and they used to call us bar and grill. And I was like, a stu so like he knew me as Grill at Syracuse University. It was, I think I was the class of 65. The sweetest guy, but I never showed any inkling 
that I would be a poet or in music. And, late, and years later, you meet him again and you... He you played on him. Soul of a Woman. Yeah, he works he, with you. He played on the PF record. I wasn't there, but they called me from Nashville. Is that a weird he played on it? Yeah, I love Felix and I have good memories with him. Do you love the Rascals? I love the Rascals, too. He's a great guy and it was fun, but being his fraternity brother makes it special. The only thing is, the reason I didn't follow through more, and Phil Sloan brought up to me, you know, he probably thinks... You were fraternity brothers with him. You don't call him for years, and now that he's famous, you want to connect. So I, I love Felix, but I didn't over make the connection yet with Steve Cropper, who worked on that album, the new one. With but wait a second, what the fuck were you doing in a fraternity? You're always so anti that kind of frat boy drinking kind. That's not you. Well, I got a. I went through a phase where I guess I wanted to try and be a little more like a, a Kennedy. Right. If you look at my picture before, <laughs> before I went nuts with the hippie thing, I was like, <laughs> I had the ascot. I got you've seen those pictures. I have. The Beach, like in the, the Beach Boys met me, I was like a very stylish, like more in the Kennedy tone, and then all of a sudden I became like you know Zarathustra, or which I think I called myself. God, that took a little arrogance, didn't it? Zarathustra and Thalibi <laughs> by group for the Beach Boys. That was a little nuts, but. You have the best hitchhiking story of all time, as far as I'm concerned. Which one? Uh, I think professional football players picked you up hitchhiking. Tim, oh, yeah. Tim, Ernie he, Davis no, and no, Jim Brown. No, but, but here's what's interesting. I asked you one time, <laughs> when you went to Syracuse University, did you ever get to see Jim Brown play? Which you didn't, because he had graduated in 1957, and you kind of arrived a in white early Cadillac. 60s. But the thing is, he was still a fixture around Syracuse yeah. University, and he was a mentor to the running back, Ernie Davis, who that sadly died of yeah. leukemia and they in 1960. And so, they picked me up in a white Cadillac convertible with the top down, put me in the middle. We hung out all day. They, do, they, they were really friendly with me. I wasn't even really a poet yet. And I was so thrilled. So I was hanging out with these guys. Also, my dad was a pro golfer. I'm a big sports nut, but no one ever talks to me about it because they think I'm a poet. I'm not interested. Did you get to see Jim Brown later in, in Hollywood at clubs? Around yeah, the I, I saw him a couple of times, and he remembered me, and we talked, but I never really hung out with him. And it's funny how it works, as Jim Brown was kind of the sponsor of the group, the Friends of Distinction. Yeah. And, 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 and Harry from the group is plays softball with Gary Strobel, who's oh, cool. our cameraman today. Cool. I, mean, and another, I mean, welcome to Hollywood. And another, We're not all plastic, another phony thing, people. The thing about Syracuse was like a party school, too. It was a great school, both the big football games. I remember one story, which I <laughs> countered of my anti-drinking. I did drink one day. I went to a sorority. They had a party before the football game, and we had a great seats. So we were all going to go to the game, and, you know, it was a fun social thing. And I had a couple of margaritas or something at the sorority next door. I wake up several hours later. Some girls, like, slap my face. I missed the whole game. I passed out. <laughs> Mark, I, mean, I, at I never got to see at, at Syracuse University. Did you have the instructor Delmore Schwartz? No, but I knew of him. He was a presence at the university. Yeah, yeah, he was yeah. one of Lou Reed's. I know Lou there. told me about it. Yeah, Lou Reed and Billy Bentley, uh, and we went out to dinner with Godfrey Helmine, who, who Lou was friends with the artist, who's still good friends with me. What was Lou Reed like socially? Lou Reed with me was really wonderful and asked questions. That night on stage, it was at the Wiltern. He brought his karate or. What, tai Marshall, Chi. Tai Chi instructor with him, and he had dinner with us, and he would do movements on stage. And he had a great, was it a cello or a violin? No, I think it was a cello player. That, do you know who I mean, Harvey? She played the greatest electric cello. Mm -hmm. Ruben Blades was there and everything. And I went up to her after, I said, I love you, you know, because she played that electric cello like, you can't believe it. And he did The Raven. Do you remember his version of mm -hmm. The Raven? Mm -hmm. It was so amazing. Billy Bentley was his was his public relations then, was a buddy of ours. How did California Feeling 2 start? Obviously it's a sequel, sort of, to California Feeling 1, but tell me, what, were the, what was the approach or the developmental aspect of in the preparation stages of doing this, this thing? Well, Alan Boyd helped a lot on the first one, California 1, and the second one was mostly Mark and I, and John Tiven did help us a lot, too, putting the, and Rob Bonfilio, and Carol She's great. Carol is great, our owner of, of the record company. Clara Schofield So she commissioned a second album. Yes, she commissioned a second album. And did she album. have any input as far as let's do this or suggestions? She has or some, but I think now she has more. But at that point, she has uh, she had some, but I, I, I think it mostly was her and Mark. 
But what uh, there were a few mistakes on this release in the sense I'm saying this in front that some of the credits weren't exactly right. And that's why I hope to clarify some of it. But on but she said that she will she's going to do a vinyl of it, and that everything will be taken care of. It's a wonderful record. It's getting a great response. What is it about California that completely engulfs you every fucking moment? I guess. Are you grateful to be living? Is it one of those deals? I'm grateful to still be alive, but California is the whole feeling of America to me, of the West, of that even with all the terrible things going on and all the sadness, that some of your dreams and some of your hopes can be realized in music, in art, in poetry, in compassion and what I would like to see is what I did is I combined California with world peace and with the open road and with Walt Whitman and with whatever I'm feeling and I tried to even see it and you'll, you may disagree with me but I even see it like in Tupac Shakur and some of the rappers I'm seeing an articulation of trying. Why would I disagree with that? I've interviewed Ice Cube. I I three said times. you. I just said I just said you might. I'm not. No, I, I'm the I'm I focused on you specifically. I already know about his trip from Oakland and all that sort of stuff. Okay. But I'm asking you. Yeah, I I love California. It I felt it's a place where I could be free to express myself, and where I could express my ideas. But I also it's like being in a waltz, being in a ballet, being in a dance that I get up in the morning and I want to sing. And the little bird did look down and sang a song to me. The little bird was in California that gave me that first song. Be still, even though I felt it before, I, I was receiving these messages in California, these inspirations. It was the sunlight, it was the land, and even with the sadness, there were still elements of hope, but there is a, a dichotomy between this beautiful, wonderful, and how most dreams don't come true. So the dreams that you dare to, it said in The Wizard, really do come true. You know, it's a beautiful song, and I love it, but it's not quite true. Most people's dreams, most people have adjusted dreams. What adjusted dreams? Yeah, they have, you have to, reality deals you blows, and very few get exactly what they want. That, that's what, from my experience. You can disagree, it's just my opinion. I'm gonna throw out the titles at you. Helen Keller. Helen Keller is a poem I wrote that Stacy Keach recorded on this album. And we, he did write music for it, but Carol said I want it with no music to open the album, which I think turned out that her idea was better. How far back do you go with Stacy Keach? Dick Gutman, if you a want to- A publicist, yeah, yes. A sweet, good friend and his wife Gisela introduced me to Stacy. He liked my poems. We even talked about writing songs together and we would jam sometime. And he started recording some of my poems. So I said, would you do this? And he did it. And we put it on the album. And the poem is about Helen Keller. I was so touched by her life. I met Patty Duke later, who played her in the movie. Where'd and you I, meet Patty Duke? I, John Aston was married to her and he became a good friend because I practiced. But weren't you in Buddhism with him? For a month or so, I did Nam Yoho Ringo. I saw you take your shoes off at a at a meeting on Cynthia Avenue, in West Hollywood. You did. I saw Were you. Were you in it? I was. I was hanging out. I was looking I for. I didn't even hold I, it. I was looking for girls. I wasn't. I, I wasn't into the religion. I didn't know. But you. I saw you hanging with John Aston. Yeah, so yeah. That, John this is going back forty years. John man. Aston was one of my closest friends, but I I finally told him. You know, they took that Gihanson, whatever they call it. They put yes. up. They took it down because I. I didn't believe it, and my ex-wife thought I was going nuts. She said, what are you doing? You had incense in your hand, I remember. You yeah, did the whole bit. Yeah, I, I tried it. and I, <laughs> sh Shakabuku, you know, blessings, but they were just a little too Nami Orange I'm not saying it's bad and it works for a lot of people, but I got sick chanting, too. Okay, so that explained, okay. I'm not I'm not upset with them, but I'm just saying that I did try it. Was Patty cool? Very cool. John was really cool, except the only thing is any time had a... Anyone has a philosophy, Harvey, and they say that's the only way, which a lot of religious people do. I can't believe love could pick only one way. Because to me, and it's not pantheism, it's even reflection. When I look at the universe, love is, and music is in all things. That's what I like some of the Sufi poets. 
trees, flowers, the experience, the stars, everything contains music and poetry. And what I want to do, and I'm starting to draw now and paint, is to bring the music out from me and try and bring it out in others, but not tell them how to do it. But each person must find their own way. My thing is about not telling you to believe what I do, but find your own stillness, your own thing within you, and and live your own tune. Um, Question. Yes. Carl B. Wilson does your composition, Rainbows. Carl B. Wilson, I love this kid. He is the son of Dennis, but in his own, he's a great singer. And he, he did Rainbows that I wrote with Carl and Dennis. And on background singing, I'll talk more about Carl, is Justin Wilson, which was Carl's son, and Matt Jardine, Al's son. And they helped me. And Rob Bonfilio, who's married to Carney Wilson, produced it and did a beautiful job and, and really did most of the tracks okay. uh, and got it ready. And it's a whole new version. And Carl B. sings a beautiful vocal to me. I'm so grateful to him. He's the sweetest kid. I love him. Tracy Landecker does something called Sometimes She's Odd. Tracy Landecker is a great singer. She's got a group called Walker Brigade. I think you've met her, Harvey. And she's just a wonderful singer and a great talent and a great writer. She wrote this book, uh, and uh, she's just... She's just. Well, did you ask her to do a vocal of one of your tunes? How does that? She, she, does heard, she heard it, and I and and John Tivin sent it to her, and she she did it, and she recorded it. And this is a killer version. It'd be great. I mean, you've heard it, Harvey. She's such a great singer. She she wrote a, a script called Tiny, and a story, and I love that. I I hope someone would make a movie out of it. And she's a very good friend of mine, along with Ellen Boyd, and they're two really good friends. Okay. Of mine. Neil Innes does. The song is about me. This is a song about me. Neil Innes, I uh, believe it, we haven't met in person. We know through the phone, through Mark Lynette, who I guess met him from Al Gomes, some friend of mine that's in PR, that's helping me with another project. And uh, I, I thought it was Mark, but Al told me it was him. But I, I like to give credits because people like to get their credits. So anyway, so Neil and I start talking on the phone and calling and we, and I sent him a lyric and he put music to it. And I love Neil Innes. I love the Monty Python stuff. I love the Ruddles. The Sweetest Guy. And I think it's a great song. I'm honored and thrilled to have Neil Innes on this record. And I hope I can do more with him. And it's funny because he was worried about the credits. And because I'm, as Harvey knows, I'm a laid back poet. He wanted to make sure he was properly protected and all that. But I thought it was funny, like asking me something like that, which I'm the last person who would ever do anything um, like that. Who's Dylan LeBlanc? I think he's got a record down number four on, on the charts all over the world. He's a up-and-coming young singer in his 20s and the most amazing singer. Did you hand him the I Don't Have no, a John, Clue tune? Or? John Tiven is friends with him and worked with him, and somehow he consented to do a duet with me. And I mean, I'm not in his league as a singer, but I'm so honored, and I think that I may even do another song with him. And he's got a huge... A record out that is on the charts and uh, okay. Dylan LeBlanc look for that name but you all work with things. Ralph Stevens well, how does that come together Ralph Stevens is a great guy who worked with Earl Brown you know from Deadwood and all that mm -hmm. and he did songs even in his movie he's a great composer and talent we've been friends for years I met him through Jackie DeShannon and Randy her brother years ago mm -hmm. but, Randy but, Myers yeah. yeah and Ralph and I stayed friends and Ralph I'm singing Ralph produced this record of me and we got some back I want to say and I think it's a great it's kind of a talk sing thing and uh, and he got another fellow to help him I'm sorry Ralph I'm the name is skipping me but you got to realize I'm aging <laughs> okay listen and by the way did, did John Tibbon bring you Ellis Hook to do Los Angeles tune yes Ellis Hooks did a beautiful version of our song Los Angeles and I, I wrote that when I was going downtown Los Angeles all the time, sitting in front of the library, walking with the homeless, and I, I would, I sat in the middle of the night and I wrote that lyric and sent it to John Tivin and he put it beautiful. Steve Cropper did an instrumental version of Little Bird. I love Steve Cropper. Tivin says now the, he sees him more when I'm in Nashville than when he's alone there. I'm really excited about that. And I tried to pay him something, he said no. Fran. Kowalski, who's passed away, played keyboard on that, and I wanted, 
what a sweet guy. I, I want to give some attention to the musicians who don't get credit on this album. Maybe that people don't know. He played the keyboards, and I, I loved Fran. He was a huge fan of Little Bird and Be Still. Lucy Jones. Lucy Jones. This is a story of Lucy Jones. Five foot tall, she skin and bone. She rides a motorcycle and she rides a Jeep. She's up all night when everyone else is asleep. Whopping and a bop. Anyway, I love this song. It was totally mentored by Brian Wilson. He didn't want any credit for it, but it was totally mentored by him. And I think he's even playing the piano, whether I'm supposed to say that or not, but Harvey, that's the truth. Okay. But he, he gave me this song and helped me and coached, you know, and, 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 and gave it to me as a gift. But I just, if you listen to this song, now I'm no great singer, but it's a lot of fun. It's a hoot. And it, okay. it's raw. It's not even a, we didn't even master it. So. Okay. You and John Tibbon also kind of teamed up with um, When I Change My Mood or something called that. John and I are singing it as a duet. And uh, he's a great, a great singer. And he's my partner in Yo Mama and a wonderful guy. And we co-produced the Ellis Hooks record, which I didn't tell you, which Los Angeles is also on the Ellis Hooks record and which got a lot of airplay in Europe. A lot of airplay. Here's I, this is my favorite title on the album. I will not love you forever, because I'm tired of all that. I will love you forever. It's about time somebody at least did a full declarative statement, and ran it down and said up front, it's not happening. Carl B. Wilson wrote the music, the mm -hmm, track. Mm -hmm. It's more of a spoken word, and I would say, you probably won't believe it, that my inspiration for that probably as God only knows. I didn't hear that. Well, if I took it to a level of a, maybe a more spiritual level, but I think as you listen to that song, it's one of my favorite tracks, and Carl B. did a great, great track with it. And the other inspiration was to try and capture in a poem these kind of feelings about love and about life that's accessible to people. I think that whole poem, Harvey, that if Carl and I sit down, I could probably make a song out of it, like a, a Beach Boy style song. Because Only you could write a lyric called Lost on the Moon, considering you've never visited the place. Why did you draft Alan Boyd to, uh, to play the music and sing it? Alan Boyd, Lost on the Moon, is one of my favorite tracks. In fact, he had to tone it down. I had so much swearing in it. but. Peddlers of Utopia, away from the dawn, everything shows for what it is, who is king, queen, and pawn, like dirt, you could be swept to where the dreams are all gone, out on the street, it's damp and it's cold, don't give a shit if you're young, don't care if you're old, there ain't nothing to lean on, and no one to hold when you're out on the streets. Ellen Boyd's voice on that, and the dark chords, I really like it, it's, it's a, it's, it was, it's about the homeless I saw, it was about Dennis at the end of his life, it was about the people that somehow part of them on the journey got lost and some found their way back through the music, some never found their way. Doesn't Lost on the Moon is a good description of a lot of people in downtown Los Angeles, downtown Chicago, downtown New York, downtown Detroit, downtown Bombay. Mm -hmm. That's my that's the origin in the, of that song. Is there anything else you'd like to add about if you knew your, um, you know, your collaboration with P.F. Sloan? I would just like to say that this poem has brought me great honor uh, and inspiration that they picked it for Children's United Nations in Washington to read in front of members of the House and Senate, both parties, Hillary, Nancy Pelosi was in then. I went to Washington with Goldie Hawn and Dr. Dan Siegel, the guy, uh, the great guy that believes in uh, mind mind science, I guess, a uh, mind awareness. Uh, he's got a book out, Dan, Dr. Dan Siegel. Mm -hmm. And it was a great, and I did it in front of a large audience of members of the Senate and the House, and there were other people. Jeff Daniels was on the bill, Shaka Khan, Lily Hayden, which I know you know. And it was a beautiful evening and about Children United Nation, Nations, children in third world countries and trying to bring banking to them and resources and help with medical and it was a, it's a wonderful organization and Daphne Simon brought me there. Okay, you um, 
You dusted off an old tune. You danced my heart around the stars that Mary Wilson of the Supremes does. Yeah, Gus Dudgeon produced the original. I loved that song. I did it. I was at A&M Records, I believe. Oh, no, I think I was at Motown. Mm -hmm. I, anyway. You were a Joe Bet songwriter. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have been at Motown. I'm Anyway, I can't believe my memory. But anyway, Mary is a good friend of mine. She's the sweetest person. We wrote another song, which we're looking for a melody on, but we haven't found the right one. She is such a great person, such a great soul. But she, I said, Mary, can I re-put it on this album again? And, and she owns the master. And she said, yeah. And uh, it was just the idea of like, in a world of Cinderella's where the slipper seldom fits, you came and softly touched me with your light. You dried up all my tears, wrote a smile upon my heart. You gave my life a beauty that will never part. You dance my heart around the stars. And she does it so beautifully. And her voice is like, she never sang that, that high on the Supremes that I know of, but she did such a beautiful job. This song gave me chills. And it was almost the theme song for uh, Cyrano, because he was an astrologer in that movie. But Bones Howes said the director's son gave the son the music with no words. But it came that close to being the theme song for Cyrano de Bergerac, director movie with and Daryl Hannah. Paul Steele does the end of inspiration. Paul Steele is one of the great artists out of the UK, the great young artist with a great high voice and a beautiful talent. He's got a records out called April and, and Me or April and I and he's got now two and uh, he this song, The End of Inspiration, is that time in your life when you feel there's no inspiration, there's nowhere left to turn, everything is turned to black. How do you get through it? Sometimes it feels like the end of inspiration. Have you felt that? Have other people felt that? It's addressing those issues that, will the inspiration come? Will my pains get better? Will I be able to pay my rent? Will I be able to survive? Can I find some joy in this life? Will there ever not be problems? Sometimes it feels like the end of inspiration. But it kind of leads to a logical tune called Anytime USA that David Marks does. <laughs> David Marks and I were in the car going to one of his gigs. It was a Beach Boy weekend or something. So I started writing it down in the car. Anytime, anywhere, any place, USA. And before you know it, the song, and he put that great melody. And it's a fun, it's a fun song. David Marks is a great writer. He's a really good guitar player. He's a great guitar player, too, but he's also a great composer and underrated. But we did another song, which it's not on this album, but called I Fall Into the Grace, which I love that song. It's so inspirational. He's so talented. Your album concludes with My Love Lives On by Carl B. Wilson. Yes. My why, why did you um, end the album with that? That's one of my favorite songs with Dennis, and it was just on that California box set, uh, Made in California, yes. with a six disc or so. Carl, I love that song. It's like a total dedication song that after everything else, after all these albums, after the Beach Boys and Pet Sounds and World of Peace, and after all the world is gone and spins, my love lives on. After death, after life, my love lives on. When you feel down and life seems lost, I'll give you my best. My love lives on. Carl B. delivers it. My love lives on. And this is a message I would like to leave with people, that no matter what's happening, try and keep your love focused. Um, I may seem like I'm out of touch with the times, but I'm very in touch with the times. I'm aware of all the wars and violence and anger and hostility. But in my own small way, I want to make some kind of contribution to encourage other people and to be a statement for peace. I just in finishing up. I, I wanted you to talk about Mark Lynette, who compiled and produced and actually mastered this recording. You've had an ongoing studio. Mark Lynette is first of all when I didn't have a place to stay a few years ago, he offered me his place and he gave me such a rate that you never would see it at the Hilton, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, was a mentor, produced albums, got me deals, and uh, and his wife Margaret and, and their son uh, Johnny and uh, Angelica, the, they, they all helped me through a really rough period in my life. And, I, and also I'd like to, can I, I know this is a tape for video, but I'd like to thank my dear friend Chip and Kathleen Rosenblum. Um, 
Scott Brittingham and Ella and his kids, Tommy and Poppy and all the people who have been helpful to me, and Carol and Harvey, and there's so many more. I'm leaving a lot out. Brian Wilson and all the people, Marilyn Wilson, all the people that have been good to me. I am so grateful and so blessed to be a poet and to be in California and to share this. And I'm grateful to have a good friend like you, Gary, who I'm getting to know, and Harvey to help me with this video. So that's my message for whatever time we have left. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. Amen. God bless. <laughs>